This lecture is going to be on voltage control barrier problem. I find this to be actually one of the most fundamental questions in starting and in, in looking at what we want to do for device physics. I also find it to be one of the more important questions when I want to ask questions about what device physics do I need for circuits. It's kind of one of the most one of the more key questions you're going to ask. And in doing so, we're going to actually see that there's a few things in device physics that we need, but only a few. And so we're going to talk through those as we as we work through this discussion. One, you know, a couple things we'll see. The concept of conduction and valence bands. The concepts of Fermi distribution and Fermi level, which describes the distribution. But the fact that the Fermi distribution is exponential, uh, exponentially decreases as I go higher in energy. So it means the probability of finding an electron gets exponentially lower. And then finally, uh, talking about things like quasi-Fermi levels, because it becomes important to understand how do you actually, when you have a metal contact and you can actually move a potential, what does it mean? So if you look at it, you can sort of look at this barrier problem right here. And one of the things that I like to ask the question always is start with, well, what, hap what is it needed for an electron to go from side A to B or a side B to A? Now, if I'm talking about an electron, I'm talking about that primarily because I'm talking about a conduction band where the Fermi level is just assumed to be easy for this problem to be constant right at the conduction band. And as a result, I'm going to assume that this barrier is a height E1. So for an electron to go from side B to A, all that's really necessary is for that electron to find its way in the conduction band, find its, you know, find its way over there. We know that that conduction band is flat, so we know that the way it would move would be diffusion. There's no field here to work with, so we're, that's what we're going to be expecting. And from there, we're going to build, uh, sort of just kind of find it, had, find it moving, and it's just going to fall over by diffusion. And then it'll fall there, and by the time it gets to this edge, it's going to literally just fall off the cliff. No problem. What happens for an electron on side A? Well, it's got to find its way towards the edge of this barrier, but it's also got to have enough energy to get over that barrier. This is where the probability of electrons as a function of energy is really critical. Well, we know the Fermi level is right at the conduction band, so we know effectively what that probability will look like. Now, all of you would probably remember, or might remember, um, that the probability of an electron has a very particular function for, for Fermi particles. It is a, it's a 1 over a 1 plus an exponential of an e to that energy minus Fermi level over kT. Now, the question becomes, well, if I'm significantly above the Fermi level, what, how would I approximate it? And it turns out to roughly be an exponential function. In fact, if I looked at this, the probability of energy being above E1, you know, probability of having some electron, at least at E1 or higher, is effectively going to be proportional to uh, E1 minus the Fermi level over KT. You think, okay. And you could be very careful and rigorous about this by imagining integrating over all those states, but if I take an integral of an exponential function, I basically get that function back with some constants. No problem. And I imagine that if I do this again for another function, I'm going to get roughly the same constants. Well, the question then, so I have to get that much energy and I'll cross. So then I ask a different question. What happens if that barrier gets pulled down by, by a potential voltage by some amount V? Now that energy would have to be Q times V because we're talking, because everything in energy band space is an energy. <clears throat> and further, um, we're going to find that increasing energy um, goes up for electrons in band diagrams. So when I increase the energy, uh, inter when I increase the potential on, or I increase the voltage on it, that's going to basically pull from an electron perspective, it's going to pull this, this potential down. <clears throat> and so now my barrier looks like this energy E1 minus QV. So I could write that down too. And that's where my energy level would be and I would get a fairly similar expression. You might think this is just simply, you know, an intellectual exercise. Um, until you realize that, you ask this question, well, let me divide these two probabilities. It still sounds a little intellectual, but what happens next is, <clears throat> yeah, of these particular cases, is the function I get of these is now equal to E over V, the voltage I dropped, over UT. UT is that KT divided by Q. 
voltage we're used to using 25 millivolts, 25.8 millivolts, depending on 25 or 4 millivolts, depending on what temperature your room is. I tend to like it warmer, so probably I prefer the 25.8. Um, but the, the point is, is it's meant to be, you know, this is really where this exponential comes from. And if you look at so many of the device physics properties we're going to see, um, whether they be MOSFETs, whether they be nano devices, whether they be, you know, even going back to vacuum tubes, you find that these voltage control barriers are critical in all of these problems. And it changes by this. And the reason we'll get this exponential, which usually doesn't get talked about, is entirely because of this barrier problem. <clears throat> now, for those who are astute, you might actually notice that this problem feels a whole lot like a PN junction problem. And in fact, directly from this, you could almost directly solve for what the PN junction, uh, PN junction functionality would look like um, <clears throat> by simply taking what's the current going from A to B, which is the E to the V over UT, and the current going from B to A, which is constant. And they go in separate directions, so they have to have, so you're going to have a different sign. So all of this works out fairly smoothly. Um, but everything comes from this problem, everything starts from this problem, and understanding it is often gives a lot of depth of understanding of device physics, and understanding it really gives a sense of some very critical things that are important of modeling when we get into circuits.